welcome to Multi-Virtual 2020's Right Track. I'm Vanessa Junta. I'm the director of the Right Track, and this is Make Me Laugh, Writing Humor in Speculative Fiction. Humor isn't as easy to write as it might seem. So we're really glad you're here to join our guests for a discussion on what works and what doesn't, and how to gauge how well your own writing might tickle readers' funny bones. If you're watching this as part of the convention weekend stream, join us on the Discord server in the Right Track channel for a watch party with some of our panelists and, you know, us people who aren't actually panelists. You can wa we can watch it all together. Instructions on how to get onto our Discord can be found at multiversecon.org slash Discord. Every year, we choose a charity to donate to. This year, we're giving to the Equal Justice Initiative. You can help us by donating at our Ko-Fi site. That is ko-fi.com slash multiversecon. All donations minus fees will go to support the Equal Justice Initiative, and you can find out more about them at eji.org. And don't forget, for more about our panelists, please check the links below for um, videos from them, or you can go to multiversecon.org where you can find links for all of our guests. Now I'm going to pass it on to our moderator, Lee Martindale. Hello, and welcome to Writing Humor in Spec Thick, where the job is for us to make the reader laugh. Uh, my name is Lee Martindale. It's my pleasure to be your moderator. Uh, and I am joined by some of the best in the business. Let's start with brief introductions. Ginny, starting with you. Hi, I'm Ginny Koch. I write the Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series for Daw Books. And I also write under a variety of pen names, including G.J. Koch, J.C. Koch, Anita Ensall, Gemma Chase, and A.E. Stanton. It's a controlled form of schizophrenia and a make it work for me. I write in every genre and every length, and I'm excited to be here. Jeff. I'm Jeff Strand. I'm mostly known as a horror writer, but generally a horror comedy writer. And when I veer from that genre, I either do young adult comedies, romantic comedies, smut comedy. It's always... Whenever it's not horror, there's a strong element of comedy to it. Kat? Hi, I'm Kat Rambo. I'm a Seattle-based writer and editor, and I write all over the place, but the book that I have coming out next year with Tor McMillan, which is a space opera, has a great deal of humor in it. And Paul? Uh, hey, I'm Paul Barrett. I'm a writer and filmmaker. I uh, produce two feature films, two documentaries. My writing is uh, sci-fi fantasy, and uh, the, the comedy series I have is The Spade Case Files, about a detective who's a dwarf. I call it uh, J.R.R. Tolkien meets uh, Elmore Leonard. That's kind of, uh, kind of my, my big comedy thing is that, and also just in writing in general. My, anything else I do, I tend to have a lot of comedy in it. Um, my first, I guess, concentrated comedy writing in SpecFic was for Selena Rosen's Bubba's of the Apocalypse <laughs> series. Yes, we were writing rednecks. Um, zombies, also. Uh, I have a tendency to incorporate humor in it, almost everything I do uh, because, well, it's human. And then I, then I started working with Esther Friesner. And the rest, as they say, could get me blackmailed at any rate. What got you started writing humor in, in your spec fic? Uh, Jeff, start with you. I'm not actually used to that question because usually it's, how did you get started writing horror? And I say, oh, well, I started writing humor. So, Humor just came from my DNA. That's just what I always enjoyed writing. I, you know, loved um, Bananas Magazine, Dynamite Magazine, anything for kids that was funny, I enjoyed. So, you know, that was basically my reading material was 
comedy. And it, I was writing it just you know, to goof off with my friends. It wasn't until I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that I realized you were allowed to be that silly in an actual book. <laughs> so that was a big eye-opening. Wow, you can, you can be that stupid and actually make a living at it. Of course, it took me a very, very, very long time to make a living at it. But yeah, it just, I've always enjoyed comedy and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the one that made me realize you can do it and be in bookstores. Paul? Um, <clears throat> mine actually follows fairly close to Jeff, I, other than except horror. Mine was more uh, science fiction, fantasy. Uh, I always was a big fan of humor just in general. I mean, that's I think most people were. Uh, but yeah, just essentially, any to me, any drama, any good drama has an element of humor to it. And then if you can take that and just sort of go off the deep end with it and be silly, like Hitchhikers was also sort of the one that told me, yeah, you can be kind of stupid about it and have fun with it and enjoy it. So I just kind of kind of went with that. And uh, the Spade Files are really the first sort of big humor-based thing I've done. Uh, everything else has been, there's just a lot of humor in it just because my um, personality in general is fairly sarcastic and kind of uh, doesn't take anything terribly serious anyway. So it's just, I kind of let that go into the writing of anything I do. Cat? Well, I was a child back in the olden days when uh, if you wanted something to read, sometimes you were confined to what was at hand in your house. And I was <laughs> lucky enough to have grandparents who had a great deal of two particular authors, James Thurber and S.J. Perlman. And so I read a great deal of them as at that age when this stuff sort of impresses itself on you and thought it was just so amazingly funny and wonderful that I wanted to uh, try and get some of that in my writing as well. Jenny? Uh, well, my background is, I guess, a lot like cats. My family had a lot of older books and I read them all. And my favorite humorist of all time is Robert Benchley. <sighs> so I just devoured all of his stuff and everybody else's too, but he was, you know, I just loved him. But when I started writing, I wrote very, very serious, um, deep, meaningful stuff that, um, and I had a friend who convinced me that I needed to start writing down all the funny stories I would always tell. And my first professional sale was a humor piece. And uh, because of that, when Touched by an Alien, which is the first book in my Alien series, came started coming out funny i let it ride and let it roll and it gave me a career so yay humor yay humor um i picked up the first chicks and jane mail anthology it's all esther's fault <laughs> okay there's that that old saying attributed to, to everything from the greeks to every comedian we've ever seen on tv drama is easy Comedy is hard. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree or disagree with that statement, Jeff? For me personally, I've been doing this so long, it kind of naturally spills in. So I would disagree for me personally. However, trying to train someone to write comedy, I would say it's way harder than drama. I think mm. someone says, well, can you teach me to write comedy? No, I, I, that's really, really hard. Whereas, can you teach me dramatic story structure? Sure, there are very clear rules to follow. But comedy is very, very instinctual, at least for me. It's, you know, it's not a formula. If it's a formula, it's bad comedy. So a lot, for me, it's just sort of, 90% it, of it naturally flows in there. And then the last 10% is, is the word there or this funnier in this particular joke? And, you know, the fine tuning, which takes forever, the best, the head smashing, you know, is what is funnier. But I would say 90% of it is just the instinct. And then the last 10% is making it funny with the small details. Jenny? Uh, I totally agree with the statement. Uh, one of the reasons I write horror as J.C. Koch is that it's really nice to kill things and let the bad guy win. In and not have to make somebody laugh after I've slaughtered, which I have to do in my main series. And whenever I write as uh, G.J. Koch, both of those names are funny and I have to be funny. I'm with Jeff. I think it really helps if you're a funny person naturally. 
or a funny storyteller, or, you know, you were the kid, you know, snort the milk out of their nose. Um, I think it can be taught, but I'm, I, again, I'm right there with Jeff. It's, it, it takes more work. When I'm writing something funny, I'll write all the dramatic parts of it and, you know, and, and the joke, but then I'll go back and I hone the joke and hone the joke. I'll watch a lot of stand up uh, uh, to be able to, to watch their timing because you create the same kind of time with your punctuation, your paragraphs, your periods, so forth. So it, it's difficult, but it's worth it if you enjoy it, which I do. Well, I think there's two things at play here. And one is uh, humor, yeah. When humor is written badly, humor can be just so, so awful. And forced humor can just be freaking painful. Uh, but the other thing is I think often uh, humor has the potential to go awry in a way that some other stuff does not. And that humor has the potential to be incredibly cruel. Uh, humor can uh, be uh, hurtful when uh, mis-aimed, I think. And I think that's something that you have to think about. Uh, it's very easy sometimes to sort of play for cheap laughs uh, in a way that uh, I, I don't know befits our sacred calling as a writer, just to sound pontificatory. <laughs> Oh, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, it is hard because of, of everything that everybody else has said. One, I mean, humor is very subjective. Uh, what, what I find funny, what Jeff finds funny, Kat and, and Jenny and you may not. Um, <clears throat> so, so there's that you got to kind of play with. And then it can, be, it can be cruel, but also, especially nowadays in our society, a lot of humor that would have gone, would have flown even 10 years ago doesn't because of how our society's changed or, or how people, I think to a certain extent, have become oversensitive in some respects. Um, my a friend and I were talking about that just the other day. Blazing Saddles, still probably one of the funniest movies ever done, could not be made today. Nobody would green light it because of the humor involved. But if they did, I think it would still play because people still love it. I and mean, even younger people still love it. But so, yeah, it is hard just because of all those elements. But, but when you get it right and, and people like it, then it's, it's well worth the extra effort you have to put in to make it happen. I have a tendency to have elements of humor in any of my stories. Um, I've been accused of being cruel because I... I make people laugh first and then I make them sob into their beer. Um, but the thing for me that is difficult is timing. Um, where it fits, where it doesn't fit. Uh, and just writing humor on the page. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking for ways to handle that. You know, for me, uh, actually, you know, in face-to-face fa -face comedy is about 60% timing. Uh, and it's hard to write timing, timing on the page. Um, I'd like to hear how other people handle that. Uh, Paul, let's start with you. Uh, <clears throat> that's a tough one. I, it's, it's, I, I'm not very, I don't know that I'm really good at it either. I think where my, my humor tends to lie is, is in the sarcasm and in the sort of just the, the back and forth of the characters. Um, I mean, especially, well, again, Spade, the Spade case files are sort of the only humor, big time humor I've done. And the character himself is basically take a Philip Marlowe character and just add a, a more sarcastic twist to him. So I think from my perspective, at least, film noir or those noir type stories are, can kind of be intrinsically funny just because of the sort of um, over melodramatic aspects of them, especially nowadays. So just sort of taking that and, and just putting that extra bit of uh, sarcastic dose to it is, is how I make it work, but the timing can be difficult. I think a lot of that comes in the punctuation 
or in, in how characters can interrupt each other. And, and just in, <clears throat> in general, the, the descriptive methods you use to, to get across what you're trying to say with tone and um, implication, I think, comes into a lot of that also. Okay. Um, yeah. I think <clears throat> one of your greatest tools is reading it out loud in, when you're revising. And I know uh, that is something that when I'm trying to think of kind of the pacing and the timing, because at least that way you, you've you got it, you're hearing it, uh, and you're getting a sense of how it flows in a way that's very different than just sort of letting your eyes glide over the page. Uh, you're engaging with the text in a different way. And I think that really helps with sort of the pacing and the breathing. And good to know if you're going to be reading it out loud uh, where that... Uh, 500 word sentence somehow ended up so you can split it up. Very good. Um, Jenny? Uh, well, I go back to, I, I agree with Paul. Like, I, I think you do a lot with foundation uh, where you break your paragraph, narrative versus uh, dial, and there are different ways to tell jokes and the really good standard comedians do that um, and one of the ways I personally like best is they they sort of set up a story at the start you know a beat joke and then a two beat joke and then boom 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 joke but then at the end it all comes back full circle to that first big setup that they kind of left you hanging. And I really like that. And I try to follow that as well. And so some of it, I, I really, it all, you got to fix everything in post. So it's always go back, bump up the joke, kill the joke, make it better, make it stronger, move it around, what fits where. Um, just really like the rest of the craft of writing. It's just a specific aspect of it. Okay, very good. Anyone else want to chime in on the topic before we go to the next one? No, I agree with everything that's been said pretty much. Um, you know, read it out loud and hope that the reader hears it in their head the same way. You know, for me, there's nothing more painful than listening to audiobook auditions where they're reading my work and they're mm -hmm. getting the timing all wrong. It's like, oh, no, that's not fun that way. That is excruciating for me. But yeah, going back to Paul, Paul said, yeah. situation's important. And a lot of times you're not following strict rules of grammar, which there was a lot of back and forth because especially with my young adult novels, I would be edited with strict grammar rules. Like, oh. uh, you don't need a comment there. Well, yes, the comma's there on purpose to give a microsecond pause, which is the difference between it being funny and not being funny. Because well, you can't have passive voice. Yeah, sometimes passive voice is funnier. Mm -hmm. There are certain rules that, you know, never use passive voice, show, don't tell. And sometimes, no, it's funnier to violate the rules. So it can be tricky when you're working with an editor who has their <laughs> manual style and they're not going to veer from it. Mm, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> um, what to you is the hardest situation or the hardest storyline uh, to work with when you know you've got to write something funny? Would, who Paul? do you want to go? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, <laughs> being honest. Okay. You are looking at the guidelines or you've had an invitation oh, I, that says, we want funny. Oh, okay. What's um, the hardest storyline to work with in that? Kat, let Paul think about it. Well, I, I think <laughs> you, you gotta, I'm gonna just seize the reins here because everybody's glitching a little for me and, and I'm clearly totally out okay. of control now. Uh, I think you have to do something unexpected. I think like when I'm looking at a story and I'm thinking, okay, I have to make it funny. I'm trying to think, what can I do that's new and fresh and is not just uh, the same joke that people have seen over and over again? How can I kind of create a, a new and fresh and interesting pattern with this story? Okay. Um, 
it's when I know I'm killing a character that people love and that I have to make them cry. And then in the next chapter, I have to make them laugh. And that happens a lot. There's a lot of action in everything I write, particularly in the Alien series. And uh, there are many times where I've had to, death is a reality and had to kill a character or characters that people loved. And then I have to make them laugh and I have to keep making them laugh while we go through all the dramatic stuff. Now they get to have their dramatic moments too, but to me, that's the hardest. And I have to do it every book. <laughs> Oh, um, so, I mean, I haven't had, I haven't really had to go into that or had that come about. Uh, I mean, obviously there's certain topics that, that A, you probably shouldn't try and, and make humor out of anyway, but, but would be incredibly difficult. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously terrorism or just, just things along those lines. I mean, there's certain things that, that, I don't know that you could make funny, or if you could, it would be really difficult. Um, so, I mean, anything I've done, if, if, there's, if it's gonna be humorous, it's, it's intentionally been written that way. But I, I've never actually been in this situation where I, I'd love to, because that means I'm getting enough out there that people are like, hey, let's, we wanna use this guy. So I'd, I'd love if someone said, hey, you need to take this, uh, you know, <clears throat> death of a rodent and make it funny. Okay, well, let me work on that. But anything I've written, to be humorous has, has been written intentionally for that purpose. So I've never put myself in the situation where I've said, hey, let's let's take this thing that is inherently not funny and, and see if we can put humor behind it. Jeff? Yeah, it's one of those situations, I with Pi wouldn't insert myself into that situation. Like I have, you know, very pitch black humor in my stuff and, you know, tasteless stuff, but you know, if someone said, hey, would you like to contribute to our anthology of comedy stories about sexual abuse survivors? I would say, no, I, I'm going to skip that one. You can do, pro you can do hilarious Holocaust-themed comedy, but I'm not going to be doing hilarious Holocaust-themed <laughs> So it's just, you know, if it's, unless you can find an angle where it's legitimately funny and not just push buttons, which for me is always the line. It's like, am I being entertaining or is it just trying to mess with somebody? And so I always... Okay air on the line of just being entertaining. So imagine yourself sitting in front of a room of new writers, wannabe writers, first pre-published as we call them writers. Um, and they, you, you are going to give them um, a situation and tell them to write the opening of it. Uh, what situation would you want to give them? Jeff? Uh, are we asking, are we giving a prompt? Okay, you doubled up on each other. Uh, Jenny, go, what was that? Sorry. I just had a question on clarification. Oh, uh, I look like I'm moving to me, so. Okay, let's try that again. Um, you're, st you're in front of a group, room of, group of writers, new, new writers, pre-published writers. Um, you're the pro from Dover. And you've got to give them a situation to write a, a workshop story in. Uh, give me a, for instance, what, what do you think would be a good starter for these folks? You're standing in front of a group of new writers and you have no useful advice to impart and you're scared that you'll be exposed as a fraud. Okay. I, I could write a story about that. Um, who else has a storyline that they would give them? Uh, okay. I would usually go. Go ahead, Jeannie. Oh, I was just going to say, I would usually go with um, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you and write it down. So 
to me, that's a starting point. Something fun that you personally experience. I would go with something stolen shamelessly from Connie Willis and say, start with a situation where a problem has become a crisis. And that is as broadly as I would draw that and then let them go from there. And proving once again that if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Very best, yeah. Paul? Um, I kind of go with <clears throat> sort of what Jenny said, I think, because, you know, that, I mean, obviously one of the first things they kind of teach you back in the day is, you know, write what you know. So I, I think I would go with, yeah, what to, to take a situation that, that you, that's happened to you and then, you know, tell, tell us the funniest thing that's ever happened to you or, um, you know, or just, you know, take a, um, one of your fondest childhood memories and maybe turn it on its head. Uh, might be a good way to go. I, I like just, that one. Yeah, you know, just kind of say, you know, what, or even if you want to sort of really, and I guess it depends on how advanced the writers are, because um, that kind of comes into play, because obviously you don't want to throw something at someone who's just starting that scares them off, because you could easily say, take a, take one of the saddest events that's ever happened in your life and do something to, to put some humor to it or make it funny or, or make it turn it around so that it becomes a, a situation that is, uh, you know, that, that you can t make some, some fun out of it. And also maybe that would be, to a certain extent, probably a little therapeutic, perhaps. Uh, this is why I would never teach uh, a writing class. <laughs> okay. Which genre do you think is the hardest to incorporate uh, humor in? And have you done it? And we're going to start this time with Kat. Wow. I go, why are you starting with me when it's a really hard question like this? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think like when it's science fiction that is super stressing the science, like hard SF, I think would be hard to do humor with. But I could also see somebody doing hard SF and doing something that like a physicist would just be rolling in the aisles peeing their pants uh, and 99% of the readers would just be like yeah okay um, and I could envision that I have never written in that genre and I honestly don't think I ever will uh, but I, I could see it I could envision this I see it in my head. Jenny? Uh, I'm really kind of with Kat. I write, like I said, in every genre, and I can infuse humor in it in any any one of them. But hard science, to me, as uh, soft science fiction or space opera allows you to be. So you could do it uh, if your joke is only going to get be understood by the physicist. You're not going to get published or it's gonna, not gonna land. Um, but I, I mean, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just have never wanted to try. Hmm. Jeff? Pretty much any genre that you don't have a strong working knowledge of. You know, I'm sure you can do a hilariously funny um, romantic historical novel but I couldn't because I don't know the tropes or any of that. So pretty much for me, it'd be any genre that I'm not familiar enough with to, you know, satirize. Okay, Paul. Yeah, I'd kind of go with that. Uh, or, or, I mean, certain genres, I mean, obviously, you know, Jeff brought it up, you know, I think it would be very difficult to, to write a funny Holocaust novel. Uh, I think, I think his, like a war, a war, you know, just like the World Wars or any of the wars, Vietnam War, I think it'd be really tough to to write anything funny involving that. I mean, it's been done, but it's always been really black humor or sort of satire, you know, Dr. Strange Love, stuff like that. But just to, to write an out, out and out funny thing, I think would be very difficult for really any subject that's inherently doesn't have any humor to it. I don't think war has a whole lot of humor to it. I don't think, you know, things like that. Now, you know, obviously romance, romantic novels, uh, historic novels, you could have some fun with because if you do know the tropes, that's, I mean, that's half of what comedy is, is 
taking the tropes and turning them on their heads or, or finding a, a different bent to them. Um, but I think there, yeah, there are certain things that just kind of would be very difficult just because it would border on that what's funny and what's cruel line. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, those are sort of the, I think the big ones would just be anything that's inherently tragic where a lot of people die. I don't, I don't see a, a hysterical 9-11 comedy coming out anytime soon. <laughs> so, you know, things along those lines. Um, I've written humor for, in space opera, in horror, and in fantasy. I would not try, I don't think, in hard SF. Uh, one, it's not my favorite genre to write in. And two, I've been a tech. That sort of thing makes me cry, not laugh. Um, so it's, uh, I, I, I guess it's anybody call, call. I would find it interesting if somebody took something that you don't normally get humor in and managed to pull it off. I would want to read that regardless of the genre. So you're working on something funny. Uh, what is your process? you know, starting from you're sitting there looking at the guidelines, doesn't matter what, you're sitting there looking at the guidelines. What is your process through the um, hand it in and sell it with luck? Uh, starting with the Paul. Uh, I mean, the first process would be to, to sort of, you know, obviously like, I think it's like writing anything, come up with an outline, then you come up with your story. Um, then once you sort of have that, you know, your first, second, third act, start looking at what's, what you can do to make it funny and to, to add the humor in there. Um, again, I can only sort of go back to the state case files because that's the big humor thing I write. Um, you know, what, what about the film noir genre is funny? What about the, the Dashiell Hammett? What's in those that I can make humorous or that I can sort of flip on its head? You know, you got the femme fatale, so that's obviously a thing you can throw in there. You sort of, uh, what I do is I can take a lot of the, the tech or the, the things like the guns, you know, and, and those suddenly become wands now, or like airplanes are suddenly dragons. So that, that's how you get around is, is you jump on a dragon line. So to me, it's, it's pretty much the same as writing anything. You just, you, you get your plot, you, and then, then it comes down to what in your plot and your world can you make funny, and what about your character interactions can sort of drive the humor behind it. Okay. I am much more likely to start with something like a timed writing or some sort of uh, just mishmash a couple of random things together and see what springs out. But that's partially because for me, the thing that I really love about writing humor and the point where it's really flowing and I'm happy with what's going on is when I'm writing banter and I just adore people bantering and if I can get in the flow where I hear the voices talking to each other then I'm gold uh, but I've got to somehow get to the point where where the voices are starting to emerge and that's much more true I think for humor than it is of some other things for me the, the voice has to be there before I can start making it funny. Jenny? Uh, well first of all I'm going to get a drink uh, <laughs> Probably a big stiff one because that's part of my process at all times. That's everywhere. Um, that and I do not outline. <laughs> no one else mentioned it. I was getting <laughs> concerned about the group. Uh, so I I don't outline. So there's no such thing as an outline in my life. I am an extreme linear writer. So I start with the title and the first line. And when I get to the end, I stop. And literally this is this is weaker author or it just looks interesting versus something in a novel which is it's different when it's a novel versus a short story as well but if we're going to talk a short story um i've got to come up with a funny idea and i have and i'm sure all of us and everybody else out there you know you've got your notepads and notebooks filled with ideas that 
you're never going to have enough time to write. So I go through those. If I don't have something immediately that strikes me, I'll go through those multiple times and just try to figure out, A, is there a funny idea I've missed? Or B, can I take this idea that I didn't think was going to be funny and make it funny? So, and then I drink some more because it helps a lot. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> well, for my young adult novels, those are pure commies. Those are the pacing is joke, 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 joke through the entire book. So it starts at the basic premise level because I have to come up with an idea that will sustain 300 pages of that kind of pacing. So it's like, okay, a group of 15 year olds are trying to make the greatest zombie movie ever. That that can fill 300 pages because so much stuff goes wrong on a movie set in a, with professionals. So when it's 15 year olds whose ambition is way stronger than their talent, then you know I've got my 300 pages. So from there, I don't, I don't like to do a full outline, but I have to do, you know, figure out at the high level what the major scenes are so I can figure out if there is enough content there. Then once there is, I just sort of break it down, chapter just brainstorm, okay? They're filming in the park, but scene between two characters. What can go wrong? A kid can have a birthday party. A clown can show up. And I just make a list of all the stuff I'm going to use. And then from there, it becomes more the instinctual where I just write the scene and then squeeze in as many of those ideas as I can. And then all the fine tuning comes in. But my young adult stuff, which is just pure comedy, it starts at the high level. And then I just gradually break it down. Whereas with the horror suspense novels where it's more comic relief than inherently funny, then I just sort of throw it in there as it feels appropriate. Because in a horror novel, if I have a chapter that's not that funny, it's fine. Whereas in my young adult novels, if I have two consecutive paragraphs without a joke, I have failed and have to fix them. Um, I grew up raised by what may be one of the best oral storytellers I've ever met, my granddad. And so basically what I do is I access that particular data bank, uh, back burner it, start telling myself the story that he would tell me and hope I can type fast enough. Um, he had a way of using humor uh, to make some points. And I picked up his knack for varying the timing depending on where in the object lesson he was. So I basically channel my granddad. Okay. Anybody got any questions that we're not covering that they want to see covered? Yeah. And the silence is deafening. Um, <laughs> you would put me on the spot like that. Okay. Um, one of the things I like to suggest with new writers and workshop types are uh, read the people that are doing it right. Uh, so I'm going to ask you for a couple of suggestions each on who you would tell folks to read to learn to write comedy in X genre. Uh, let's see. Kat, let's start with you. Um, I actually was just looking at, uh, you know, I really should be telling you who's, who's doing this in fantasy and science fiction. And I will say Howard Waldrop and Terry Bisson are two just amazingly funny short uh, story writers. But uh, this is an English series uh, that for some reason I feel compelled to put in chat, uh, even though it won't show up in the video. Uh, E.F. Benson's Map and Lucia, which are these small town English uh, village in, I think, between the wars. And they are intensely hysterically funny and deal with tiny minutia. And I wish someone would do a fantasy version of these so much because I would read the shit out of it. <laughs> but I would, I would somebody read them and, and do that, please, immediately, so I can read it. Gina. Uh, you mean Ginny, right? <laughs> I'm Gina, I, I'm sorry. It, it happens all the time. It's okay. <laughs> It happens all the time. Um, 
my, well, you already heard, I read Robert Benchley. I really like the old, what I consider comedy's old masters. So Benchley, um, Thurber, Dorothy Parker, uh, moving up a little bit, David Sedaris, uh, Steve Martin, uh, Woody Allen. All of them are very funny in short fiction. But if you're going to talk novels, to me, the god is Terry Pratchett. Mm -hmm. uh, love him, worship at the altar. Douglas Adams is great, but for me, Pratchett is is the one, and uh, and the one that proved to me that you could that you could could sustain it well, not only over a novel but over a very long running series. Jeff covered Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams. I would say outside of the genre, I think the funniest writer is Dave Barry. Oh, yeah, um, yes. Probably, I... probably the biggest influence on my style would be Dave Barry. In genre, I think uh, David Wong, Perspectic, he did uh, John Dies at the End. He does, yeah. his early stuff is, mm -hmm. no, he hasn't been writing that long, but his older books are more horror based and his newer stuff is more science fiction and to kind of give you an idea his new book which comes out right around the time of multiverse is called zoe punches the future in the dick <laughs> <laughs> that good is, title so his stuff is laugh out loud funny really really inventive and he's my favorite humorous spec fic writer currently working. Mm -hmm. Can I, okay. I want to do a shout out for actually, if you like Douglas Adams, I highly, highly recommend Kat Valenti's book, Space Opera, which is, manages to be, I think, as funny as Douglas Adams without being rewritten Douglas Adams. It is very funny and very sharp and super wonderful. Cool. Paul? Um, yeah, jumping back old school, um, obviously Pratchett, uh, Douglas Adams, uh, Robert Asprin, the Myth series, Fool's Company uh, series, um, Irma Bombeck, probably one of my big influences uh, way back when, uh, Dave Barry, obviously, Woody Allen, some of his earlier short stories uh, were really funny. A uh, little more modern times. Um, I'd say uh, John Harkness, uh, if we want to reach out to sort of an independent and full disclosure, my publisher. <laughs> so, uh, but his, his uh, Bubba the Monster Hunter series and, and Quincy Harker Demon Hunter series are really funny. Um, Joe Zija, uh, his Mechanical Failure series uh, was hysterical, I thought, uh, and very sci-fi oriented. Um, those are probably, yeah, probably the, the ones that... And even just sort of reaching beyond um, literature, a lot of there's a lot of good sci-fi humor uh, film and horror humor. Um, you know, obviously you mentioned John Dies at the End, uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil, you know, things along those lines. Guardians of the Galaxy was really funny stuff. Um, so yeah, those are the, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Probably more than I and there's probably a lot that all of us are forgetting too that that we've read and just can't think about right now. I know of me. Certainly. In addition to the folks you already have mentioned, um, Esther Friesner has written some wonderful uh, humorous fantasy um, for humorous urban fantasy, uh, Jim Butcher. Yeah. Uh, as well, and for humorous horror. I suppose, like uh, William Mark Simmons, the uh, Half Dead series, um, One Foot in the Grave, that sort of thing. Uh, the last one in that series was just published, and he had not lost his jobs. Um, let's see. Another one I just thought of real quick, Christopher yeah. Moore. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Okay. For sure. Uh, of course, Selena Rosen uh, has written humorous everything, uh, and some of it might qualify as PG. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've got about five minutes left. So think about it for a little bit, but one piece of advice, one bit of wisdom, 
to leave our, our audience with before we shuffle off this mortal coil. Uh, and who's ready? I'm still um, Neil Jeff. Simon. Because it's the best advice I ever heard, which is, he said, I have no loyalty to a funny joke. If the scene works without it, out it goes. And the hardest thing to do when you're starting is to have a great funny line that doesn't work with the scene and get rid of it where it's out of character, where it doesn't match the tone. And you're just like, but it's so funny. You have to get rid of it. So that, because my early stuff, you can see, I know I'm going to cling to every joke that's here <laughs> and have to cut stuff if the scene doesn't work with it, if it doesn't match the characters. So get rid of the funny lines, even if they're really, really funny. Well, be be willing to kill your darlings, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. just a second. Sorry. Ginny? Oh, I, literally one of the things I was gonna say is what Paul just said, kill your darlings. Um, but also never give up, never surrender, just, just ah. because it didn't work right in the first in the first draft doesn't mean it won't work right in the tenth draft doesn't mean the next story won't be great uh, but the you cannot possibly succeed if you give up so don't okay i'm going to reiterate read it out loud because i think that is one of the best habits a writer can be in okay paul um, that's probably my biggest one I would think is don't go into writing fiction with the attitude that you're going to be the next Stephen King mm -hmm. or the next J.K. Rowling or the next anybody. Uh, if you're going into this because you want to make a lot of money at it, you're in the wrong damn business. Uh, yeah. If you want to go into it because you want to tell stories and you want to entertain people, and maybe as a side effect, someday you can make a living at it or you can make a little money to, you know, feed your cats to the life that they're accustomed to, uh, as I do, <laughs> then, then, then you've got the right attitude to be a writer. But yeah, don't, don't go into it thinking you're going to quit your day job in a year and, and buy a Bentley. Ooh, Bentleys. I mean, um, uh, my advice is to echo read it out loud to yourself. Uh, if it doesn't come across the tongue and it doesn't make you snicker, at least when you read it, it's not come up, gonna come off the page that way either. Um, so make sure that you know it works for you uh, as you're reading it aloud. Besides, if you're lucky, you'll get to read your stuff aloud at conventions. So it's got to work. Um, for those of you who have uh, seen the, re the recording things, uh, that'll tell everybody where they can find your stuff, I hope. Uh, can you, okay, everybody, one word sentence, one, one, one short sentence to tell them where to find your stuff. Jeff. www.jeffstrand.com. Jenny www.jennycotch.com cat catrambo.com and catrambo on most social media paul um <clears throat> www.twomenandatypewriter.com which is the site for myself and my writing partner steve that's good uh w reset w harpaven.net and Lee underscore Martindale on most social media. On that note, thank you all very much for a most enlightening panel, we hope. Uh, and we hope that you who have been watching enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a great Bye. moderator, Lee. My pleasure. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Multivirtual 2020's Right Track. We hope you found the panel fun and you found it useful. Remember, for more about our panelists, please check the links below or head over to multiversecon.org where you can find links to all of our guests. We've, also, we've got so much great programming this weekend, so make sure to come out to our Discord server and hang out with us this weekend. We are at multiversecon.org slash discord. And if you go to that link, you can find all the information on how to join the Discord. 
And finally, would you like some multiverse swag? When you go to the website, check out the store because we have shirts, we have masks, we have posters, enamel pins. We've also got this really cool map that I cannot wait to come in because I'm going to put it on the wall in my office. It's going to be awesome. Anyway, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you on the next panel.